Hey everyone, welcome back to the Reactor First podcast brought to you by Passion Fruit. I am joined today by our editorial director, uh, Drew Grant, uh, also known as Video Drew Online. You know her as my co-host for Deep Linkers that we host occasionally. Uh, we're doing something a little different today. Uh, since this is our season finale for season two of Reactorverse, we're going to be going on a small break after this, coming back in the late mid-fall. Uh, I'm going to be the interviewee this time. I'm going to be interviewed by True today, and she's going to uh, just sort of, you know, examine me as it is, uh, put me in the hot seat <laughs> for once. Uh, I've been luckily uh, been able to do for uh, so many people for the past year. Um, it's been a great run so far. I'm really excited to do more um, in the fall. I think we have some exciting things on the horizon. Um, but for this one, we wanted to take a moment to just sort of reflect and you know, look back on sort of, you know, my experience in the space and how the show's developed so far um, and hopefully give some insight into what that what that's been like. Oh, thank you so much, Eric, for that. And you do have your plate of hot wings right in front of you, right? So I can be asking you questions <laughs> about your childhood while we go over all of this. I'll try. Um, you'll try. We actually yeah. have our hot dogs right here. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, guys, this is really exciting. Um, I've always wanted to talk to Nerd Chronic, a.k.a. Eric Rodriguez, uh, about his role in the reaction community because, spoiler alert, uh, this was kind of an idea that, that was dreamed up by us together. Um and I knew nothing about reactions when I, I met Eric about four or five years ago, uh, working at the Movie Trivia Schmodown, where he was the promo editor. Um, but I guess to start out, Eric, like, what got you into the reaction space? What got you into this field of, of watching people watch movies and television um, that made you so dedicated to it? Yeah, I, I, it was around 2017. Uh, 1617 is when I found it. Um, the big catalyst, as I've mentioned in many episodes with other people, is um, The Walking Dead. That was such a major show that sort of, you know, really birthed life into the reaction space along with like Game of Thrones and some other key shows. Uh, the main thing was that uh, at the time, Skybound uh, was uh, promoting uh, reaction compilations are being edited by Johnny O'Dell, now known as a J2O on his own channel. And uh, so at that time, that was sort of like, the uh, you know, a for a, a way there for a platform to sort of promote that material in a way that just wasn't really a, a thing at the time. Um, and so I found it through that and like, you know, season um, seven going into it with like the Jeffrey T. Morgan as Negan thing, uh, that big season premiere is what launched, you know, like a thousand channels in a way. And I was the one of the viewers at that point, uh, you know, looking for different people to see how they reacted to it, sort of getting into the different sort of like personalities uh, from there. I found like the normies, found Yvonne Snow, I found, you know, uh, uh, Shady Presley and just a bunch of people at the time who were big Walking Dead fans and were sharing their um their experience with it um so that's what sort of like you know introduced me to just like the concept of like you know what was going on there and from there i was able to sort of like you know see the personalities amongst that you know like uh, obviously i think the thing that people get into reactions the most for is like oh, i want to see this specific scene or this moment or this movie i like um but then when it hooks someone it's because of the personality and the, you get to know the people a little more through their you know affectations and the sort of their personality quirks and stuff like that and that's what sort of like you know drew me in it's just seeing that there's a community of people here that all have this sort of like, you know very unique insight to the material not just like well like here's the thing that happened like it's like getting to know them a little more was the, the biggest value to me oh and i think that's an interesting uh word choice you just brought up of community i mean like a lot of times we talk about creator community on the internet and we're not actually talking about like a community in, in any sense of the word of people who know each other, people who get together around certain causes. We're talking about a, a group of very disparate people with very disparate goals and stuff. But the reaction community is, it feels like maybe an actual community of people who may know each other a little bit better now in part, in large part, thanks to you and your work here on the re reaction verse, uh, uh, not to toot your horn here, but it's been almost a year, a little bit over a year, I think since we started maybe a year and a half since we started reaction uh, reactor verse as our very first passion fruit show. And we've hit um, almost half a million viewers. Um, so there's people out there who are watching us stuff like crossing the streams. We've had a, over 40 guests on you've interviewed uh, so many people who I think have gotten to know each other in the space. So what can you tell me a little bit about uh, the reaction community as it exists right now? Um, wh where's what are they interested in, in that space? What do they care about? 
Yeah. Um, the, the main thing that I've learned, you know, just interviewing people for the last year about it, um, is yeah, obviously community is such an important element of like sort of what motivates them to keep going. It's a big part of like, you know, how these, uh, channels thrive and sort of building their communities. Um, you know, previewed has like the peaches, um, you know, uh, Nikki and Steven have like the sticker, you know, community that they call it. Um, and so they started building those, you know, uh, monikers that they have for each other, um, is just important. And then that really, uh, drives, uh, interaction between them. And I, I really like the reaction space because it has community on two fronts. It has community within like the individual channels that they build for their viewers. But then amongst that, you know, behind the scenes, there is like a really, uh, tight community of like reaction channels of people, you know, work together, uh, with to like, you know, help and support each other and to, you know, inform each other about like, you know, um, tactics and sort of, you know, tricks of the trade that they share with one another. And, uh, just over the years, you know, I've seen that grow. Um, I think, uh, one of the things I noticed early on was, you know, uh, a handful of channels interacting, you know, like Blind Wave, the Normies, they uh, collab like a lot whenever they can get together, you know, across state lines. Uh, but then it's just, you know, post pandemic, we've seen that develop even more so because everyone has the ability to do everything remotely. So now I'm seeing more um, collaborations between uh, uh, channels, you know, over, you know, Zoom, StreamYard, whatever, uh, to do uh, joint reaction videos, to do collab videos, do sketches, do just like fun ideas. Um, Cinebench just did their, you know, mean comments video that they, you know, had a bunch of channels come together for. Uh, Popcorn in Bed does their Poppy Awards every year that features award nomination categories read by other channels. And mm -hmm. so it's just, yeah, it's like everything, everyone's starting to come together a little more. I think every time, you know, someone sort of crosses that threshold, it gets a little easier for people to reach out and see like, oh, it's possible to do these things until I sort of like, you know, reach out. And yeah, it's, it makes people feel not as alone, but it also informs them of, you know, how do I go about this? I think that's when like my sort of main goal with the channel with Reactiverse is just to sort of help people understand what goes into the work behind it because i because it does seem easy i think that's the misconception people have is like reactions are like low effort content that's been like the sort of uh uh yeah the stigma the stigma uh behind <laughs> it you know for a long time mm -hmm. and uh now just talking with so many people in the space over the years it's like there is a lot of work that goes into it um even if it is like you know just sitting down and watching a movie or a tv show um there's just so much you know uh pre and post planning that go into just making a single video and putting it out on a week to week basis. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to enlighten people on like what that process is like. And I mean, I don't think it's uh, I think you talk about this a lot on the show. So I don't think it's any surprise to the viewers here that you are also an editor for a lot of these channels. So you have like firsthand knowledge of what it's like dealing with some of these big issues like DMCA copyright takedown notices, dealing with certain studios, dealing with certain other, uh, you know, issues as they come up. Um, what have you seen sort of like as sort of the biggest trajectory in that in that arena or the biggest movement in that arena since you've been starting uh, editing for reactions? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've edited for several reaction channels over the years. I've edited for, I'll try to I'll re rile them out off the top of my head. I've edited for like Iman Snow, um, Epic Rin, uh, Blind Wave, The Normies, Preview, Late to the Party, Real Rejects, Akasan, uh, Kent and Sunny, uh, Cinepals. I don't know, I'm forgetting like a couple. Um, if I am, then you're seeing this, I apologize. But yeah, it's been a journey to sort of get to know more of these people um, and to work with them behind the scenes and help, you know, elevate their work as best as I can. Um, but like you said, within that, the main thing that I was, oh, Kyle Katarn. Don't want to forget Kyle Katarn, my, my main <laughs> <Love> guy. Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I was going to bring that up because Kyle was an example of someone who asked me for help because specifically um, he was having issues uh, getting past the copyright system he like every video was putting out was getting struck down he was at like a, a like a stalemate with it where he was like i can't put out a single video without it getting claimed or like blocked and he's um, specifically and a star wars creator he's a star wars creator he has another channel called grizzle wizard um where he does like non-star wars material like fantasy adjacent stuff mm -hmm. um but yeah like so him just learning how to do that on his own was you know like a, a huge hill to climb uh, he had got recommended uh, to me from um uh, someone, a mutual friend, I forgot exactly who it might have been. Um, but he, uh, he reached out to me and asked like specifically like, Hey, I'm having issues with this. Like, would you be interested in, you know, help me out with the edits, you know, to get me past the copyright system. And I helped him out. It worked out. I did the first, uh, or the, the second season of Mandalorian with him. And it's been a great, you know, working experience ever since helping him get those out. Um, but, 
yeah, the system itself has evolved over the years where I, you know, things you could do, you know, five, six years ago, just like definitely wouldn't fly now. Like, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, with the window of what you can do gets smaller and smaller each year. I think, you know, they definitely update their algorithm every year to, or so that, you know, to find things more easily. Um, I'm, you know, dreading the day when they try to toy around with AI to use that stuff. Cause I think then it's going to be <sighs> hopefully, you know, damn, not damn near impossible to get past it. But um, yeah, just helping people navigate, you know, what that's been like, because, the studio system itself has like sort of pretty much like with within YouTube has like a zero tolerance policy of like, if we catch you, like it's no, that's it. Like, you know, there's been small, you know, wiggle rooms now with like, you know, like shared revenue and things like that to keep your videos up at least. And well, you can, you can manage that. You can do the appeal process. But the main thing with the copyright system that, you know, plagues creators the most is like, it's just so nebulous that people don't have information on like how to, do it, you know, appropriately, so to speak. People are just mm -hmm. trying their best and like there's no guideline on like how to do it. Everyone's just getting second hand information from one another of like, oh, it's 10 minutes, you know, is the best way to do it. You know, um, no more than six to 10 seconds to keep it on screen, like stuff like that. It's just looking at others, your peers and seeing how they are getting by. Um, I saw someone today, Mary Cherry, asking like, you know, can I like do blood and black and white? Will that work or will I get demonetized for it? Mm -hmm. You know, people still trying to figure out how to, how to navigate these things. Um, and so for me, you know, learning more about that with the creators, um, it's been interesting just seeing like you know, their sort of different approaches, like you know, how they want to do it. You know, the real rejects are very heavy on censorship these days, just because like, you know, demonetization is adjacent to the copyright stuff where it's like, it's just so unknown. Like you can get demonetized, not even know why you, mm -hmm. you got demonetized. It's just like you, something got flagged and now it's no, no money, no money for you. Mm -hmm. And so, like, so they're very, you know, gun shy about, you know, like putting anything in that could trigger that. Um, and for the, you know, dealing with the studios now, um, I think there's, you know, an understanding being reached somewhere, uh, oh. by certain studios, uh, that you can, uh, you know, collaborate with them. Like studios are trying to reach out more, I think, to channels for like, you know, reaction material, whether mm -hmm. that be, you know, like, can we use you in a compilation or, Hey, like, you know, you get screeners, you know, to four reactions that we know that's what you're doing with it. It's okay by us. Um, I think most channels, you know, want to work within the system. Mm -hmm. They just want like a concrete answer of like how they can do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, you know, last year I had lunch with a uh, nerdy nightly, another channel. And like the way they put it was, uh, they said, you know, we don't want to buck the system. We want to work with it. You know, we want to like find out like how we can operate within it. Now we're not trying to overthrow anything here. Um, and uh, that, that's the main thing. It's like, it's just like this animosity between creators and studios because, uh, YouTube as a middleman doesn't really facilitate a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, uh, if there was an opportunity there, I think most creators would leap at the opportunity to talk with them and say like, Hey, what can we do? Sort of, you know, meet you halfway here and find, you know, what avenues are appropriate that you want us to sort of work within. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I, I think that's something that you and I have obviously talked about a lot. I think one of the things that has come up, uh, just even originally when we were when we were talking about Reactiverse as a, you know, a glimmer in the eye, was really the idea that, that there is no uniformity in what the studios have decided is a copyright, counts as a copyright violation. It's different from studio to studio. It, it does, it's determined by an algorithm. Unfortunately, AI is already here. It is already determining like auto claiming stuff uh, a very few studios like actually have somebody manually going in and deciding, you know, like on a just large enough basis, what's getting claimed and it can change from, from studio head to studio head. Uh, you know, I believe yeah. somebody once told us like Warner brothers, like almost like the day David Zavzlov came over, like that changed their, uh, the ability that, that they had to post that kind of material from Warner brothers, even if they had been previously in good relationship with them. So yeah. it's just really, it's it's a really strange, tumultuous period where you can see someone like John Cho doing wicked, like, mashups, like, posting his own mashup of other people reacting to his trailer, and then knowing you might not be able to get a whole reaction of Wicked up, even if the yeah. director wanted to see it, you know? Yeah, 
Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. Yeah. More actors and directors and talent, you know, behind the scenes of the movies are starting to pick up on it. And like I've seen people specifically tag, you know, I saw Bryce Dallas Howard tag several channels for their reactions to her episode of The Mandalorian um, mm-hmm. or episode of Book of Boba Fett with The Mandalorian um, mm-hmm. at that time. Um, and yeah, it's like, you know, it's not like a big secret. Like I think people have talked about it a lot, you know, when Warner Brothers had their, you know, um, uh, uh, the shift change over there, the, um, so many channels were getting older videos like taken down, like, you know, old Game of Thrones reactions or like, you know, Supernatural or Buffy or whatever, you know, things from like way back when, like that wouldn't even be seen today. So like, I know some people were, hard to, were just like, oh, like, okay, like I'm, I'm not going to fight for a video from, you know, five years ago that I, I put up like that's fine um it's just it's just like it's, yeah but like you said it's not it's an automated system that goes mm-hmm. out and so whatever sort of new button they pushed when that happened um is what's really plaguing people these days because again there's no conversation to be had it's just like a system that's running mm-hmm. and they don't really have the opportunity to sort of explain themselves about it i mean it is it is a it's a crazy thing and it, it's crazy too that youtube themselves like promotes revenue that you can make off of creators to studios that basically if you think you can use an automated system and make money if by, for the five seconds 10 seconds clip you can basically claim someone's whole video and that's one of the crazier things one of the most eye-opening things i think i've i've done in my own like research about this space and why uh it feels like people are making less and less money while still like getting so many views um have you seen people sort of have you have you talked to people who have have sort of navigated that space? Are people going to Patreon? Are people delving into more of the community side? I mean, how are people dealing with the fact that YouTube ad revenue is just not what it used to be? Yeah, um, it, it varies from channel to channel. You know, specifically within reactions, obviously it's a volatile market to be in. Um, I think Previewed was saying, you know, in terms of getting sponsorships, it's hard because sponsors want to know like how many views do you generate you know within a video and they're like it's hard to tell you know like maybe this movie is a hit because people really like it maybe it bombed at the box office and people don't really want to talk about it you know it's like that sort of you know those variables are hard to sort of quantify when you're trying to you know uh, assess you the value of your channel in a way um at least the ad value of it and um so most channels you know like the ad revenue as sort of like a base to use if you can sort of you know navigate that and like you know build that up that's great um but i think most of them thrive off of the community support um and sort of focusing on that most channels that i've talked to have had you know thriving patreons where uh, they're very transparent about what they do it's it's just like i you know like to do this but the specific material that we work with is copyright material and it's hard it's hard to keep up it's hard to get through most times so if you want to see me help me keep going like i would really appreciate the direct support through like a patreon or like a youtube membership you know that way you can get something you know more bang for your buck that sort of goes directly to you for that patronage um the ad revenue stuff you know i think it's definitely a smaller percentage of channels that i've talked to that have able been able to uh, figure that stuff out and to keep that on a consistent level, that's, you know, a good dependable source of income for them. Um, otherwise it's, yeah, it is Patreon and their memberships that sort of drive their, uh, their main value. Well, and I think that's like really sad because when you talk about things like television shows like Mandalorian or these episodic weekly shows, um, to appointment vis- uh, viewing, whether it's on streaming, especially if it's on streaming or increasingly rarely on, on actual television, um, you're, like you're saying, Bryce Dallas Howard seen them. I know Raul Coley watches them. Pe- the actors and people involved. So these are breaking through to the mainstream audiences. People will watch reactions to the most recent House of the Dragons episode, the most recent Rings of Power episode, and people that can find those reactions. So are is it an issue of like sponsors are just not interested in in backing even popular uh, reaction videos, or is it just like that's not even crossing people's mind that that is a space just like podcasting is a space where you can you know, support your favorite viewer or just favorite reactor who might be being watched by celebrities. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, the thing is definitely the sponsors are definitely open to working with reaction channels. I've, I've seen, you know, uh, several channels that, you know, get sponsors pretty frequently. If they're able to build that relationship, you know, they get more, you know, as you do it, you get more opportunities from them to keep going. Um, I think the main issue that we saw, especially, you know, in the last year with like the writer's strike and everything is that, the sort of concept of reaction videos as I 
navigate it with like movie and TV show reactions, and then uh, next to that, next to that, music reactions as well. Is that people don't really sort of get like what they are like <laughs> by definition or description. Like you say a reaction video, I think it was hard to explain exactly what that meant, you know, to like the you know um, screen, screen actors guild you know, the writer's mm-hmm. guild last mm-hmm. year and sort of explain like what goes into that. Like, Hey, it's like, we you know we're not just like watching like a whole movie or something. Like we're doing like commentary, we're doing like, you know, edits and like all this sort of like, you know, very unique, you know, uh, things to it. Um, so like for sponsors, I think it might be this issue of like, you know, it, it, we still need to sort of explain what the, uh, you know, reaction video is to them. So they can understand like, Oh, who's being, you know, shown this material, what kind of audience is, is it being conveyed to? And then on top of that, you know, what kind of, you know, barriers is it breaking to like the mainstream, you know, traditional media that's actually making the material that they're reacting to. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, yeah, that, that's that sort of synergy that can exist that just hasn't really been like chiseled out yet, I think, between the channels, the sponsors, the studios, you know, so they can like sort of figure that out. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, when I certainly didn't quite understand what reactions were or why, I guess I didn't understand when 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 we first met why people would watch watch alongs of of movies, like that people would just want to watch, especially in a way that was not Mystery Science Theater like making fun of something. Mm-hmm. Um what the appeal was to watching a show that you've just seen because again, this is where I think the copyright thing starts getting a little bit loopy is that no one's watching the show for the first time or the movie for the first time via reaction channel because by the very nature of how it's done and how you you yourself edit them and other people are editing them um even to get it past youtube they are cut up into like it's cut up into almost like best moments um so you're never getting the whole episode um from for the most part i mean youtube wouldn't allow it so what you're watching is a highlight reel of of like the big hitting moments um and when it's done really well uh it can seem seamless it can seem like a whole episode but it's very rare that you're going to watch the first episode of something like just by itself because of like, you're watching the reaction channel and not the original content. So I didn't. Yeah. yeah go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, like, yeah, they get cut up into highlights or cut downs. Um, and you're right. You know, the, I'd say 90% of the time, uh, yeah, people are watching it as like a second viewing um, to, share the experience that they had because they want to kind of see like what did my you know favorite youtubers think about it and like what they how they perceive it um uh yeah i spoke with adonis xavier from his channel ss jutsu and he explained it as just you know it's as simple as you see a, a funny video on tiktok or youtube and you go to your friends like hey like look at this you know mm-hmm. like that's basically what a reaction video is like it's yeah. you. It's just it, it's basically it is like a lot of confirmation bias. It's a lot of like, ooh, like did you enjoy it the same way I did? Like you're trying to share the experience that you had. Um, in some instances, like yes, like that's why it's hard. I think for reaction channels to sort of have like diverse opinions about certain things. Like you know when you like come at it with like maybe you had a negative experience, you know, about mm-hmm. watching it people don't really respond to that very well because it's like, no, this is my favorite movie. Um, so it is, yeah, difficult for, you know, a lot of channels to parse that out. Um, but the sort of concept itself of what reaction videos mean to them is, yeah, like you said, it's just sort of uh, watching the material first and then going to the channel to see, like, how did this person process it? it you know, it's like a sort of hybrid between, um, you know, having a friend there and, criticism in a way because like you Mm -hmm. know a lot of channels you know for the most part like real rejects and other channels like they are very informed about what they're watching and they're giving Mm -hmm. sort of like you know insight that the layman might not have and they appreciate that like as much as like we loved watching Eper and roper back in the day you know Mm because we thought they were you know like the the guys you know with like the insight even though they didn't like you know signs of the lambs you know or (laughs) or uh (laughs) beetlejuice you know Oh, I mean, I love to put Ebert and Roper, uh, or sorry, uh, Ebert and Roper, the, the first pairing, I think, right? Because it's uh, the other guy, Ebert, yeah. Cisco yeah, yeah. Nibbler. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they did not like Silence of the Lambs, loved Henry Porter, the serial killer. <laughs> yeah. Really funny to watch, to go back and watch those things. But you're right. I mean, that that's that's a big part of it. I also think there's, you know, that uh, emotional connection that, you know, in the worst kind of use of, of the term, it's called like a parasocial connection, but it is a, mm. a connection to another person watching something. And I think there's a lot of vulnerability. Um, it's not just quite the same thing as what I, what I heard of a lot when I went to a recent conference in, in Vegas, when I heard TikTok and other people talking about reaction videos and I got so excited. I was like, they're, they're into the space. And then I realized they meant people reacting to other TikToks, like TikTok yeah. fails or something like that. And I was like, Oh, almost, we almost got there. Yeah. Maybe we need a different yeah. name for it. 
Yeah. I mean, I imagine that might be sort of the next evolution of it. Um, you know, as I've tracked, you know, the, the, the timeline of reaction videos over the, you know, course of like the interviews I've done, you know, they started in like the 2010s or 2010s with like trailer reactions. That was like the main first wave we had. And a lot of that currency in those videos was like hype, like people getting like really excited about, you know, like the new Marvel movie coming out and getting like, you know, losing their minds and you know, going crazy over it. Um, and then the second wave would have been um, TV show reactions like Game of Thrones, Walking Dead, and people um, then getting more into like emotion about things and sort of, you know, mm -hmm. delving into like not just like getting crazy, you know, excited about it, but like, you know, crying and sharing, you know, inside and sort of like, you know, deep emotions about it. And that, you know, gave, led us into um, the 2020s with the pandemic and people getting into movie reactions, which was, mm -hmm. you know, spawned by the studios putting out movies same day as the right. being in theaters. So people had the opportunity to try that out to be like, hey, maybe I can do uh, the Batman, the Suicide Squad, you know, coming out the uh, same day as in theaters. Um, if people could share that with me. And so now movie reactions are really big you know, uh, for people to watch. That's like the main, uh, you know, sort of uh, currency people have with it. Um, and now, uh, as you're saying, like maybe as we go further into the rabbit hole, it'll be like, you know, reactions to like online content. That's always been a thing. But mm -hmm. like right now we're, we're entering the Wild West you know, like formation, big bang formation of what that is. Cause we see the conversation around it now is the uh, ethical value of it, of people, mm -hmm. you know, reacting to other people's content. What does that mean? Is it stealing? Is it like, right. you know, are you, are you undermining the original posters, you know, like viewer base by like doing that? Um, so yeah, it's a conversation that's still going on right now. It's still like in, in its infancy of what that means, but I do think it's going to evolve where, we can start building those relationships a little more. Um, again, Kyle Katarn, he built a lot of his, you know, platform off of watching Star Wars fan films. And oh. he's built that, um, you know, that uh, reputation now of like he, that. That's what he does. So he gets a lot of appreciation from people who make those films to then be seen on a channel like his who like, you know, has a lot of Star Wars, you know, fans that go see it. Um, and in that sense, like they, he, he mentions, you know, it's like, a different a specific type of appreciation because star wars fan film makers can't make a single cent off of those videos right so like it's only for the love of the game that they're doing those videos so they do appreciate it when a channel like his is able to is able to highlight them and just get them seen by other fans you're telling me that on youtube like a star wars fan video won't be able to be monetized just for using the characters that's uh that's that seems to be the, the the case yeah like i don't know maybe like maybe you can like if you can say it's I don't know under some sort of fair use law, but like, I, yeah, like I, I feel like uh, if unless they're turning a blind eye, like I don't think you can monetize making a fan film with like someone in a full Darth Maul makeup and having a double sided lightsaber, you know? Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. I never thought about that. Uh, <laughs> to, to, I wonder if Slenderman is now off limits because he <laughs> went he went from an online meme and now he's gone Hollywood. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I no, I think that there's so much we've learned. Um, and I've learned specifically from you about the reaction space, but mostly it's just been a pure joy watching you get a bunch of reactors together to meet for the first time. Like our first crossing the streams, uh, which was, I think you pitched to me as like a multiverse, you know, it's like the mm -hmm. Avengers multiverse thing. It's getting all these different channels together to talk yeah. about something like um, that might seem hyper niche within a hyper niche, which is attack on Titans finale, um, yeah. a anime show that is, Again, without you, I don't think I ever would have seen it. Um, one of the best, <laughs> one of the best television experiences I've I've ever had in my entire life, and one of I cannot recommend highly enough. And then watching channel after channel after channel react to the finale or react to like different episodes. I don't think yeah. we've gotten to that many people doing the finale yet, but like just watching everyone talk about it during that crossing the streams, it felt like yeah, it felt like a convention. It felt like a like a crossover fan event. And I just want to know what that experience was like for you. Um, you know, getting that all together. Yeah. Um, like, uh, anime has been a big part of the reaction space as well. Um, it's introduced like a lot of people to that medium. Uh, I think th it's also uh, gave people a lot of, um, you know, uh, courage to just express their interest in anime. Um, people my age and your age and like, just like anyone sort of uh, our age and above, uh, like, you know, all shared the same thing, which is like, you know, when I was in middle school and high school, like anime wasn't the cool thing to, to like, you know, it was like, cause it was like really lame or dorky or niche. Um, so like you get made fun of, but over the last, you know, generation, Gen Z and onward, um, it's 
become very mainstream. So it's so that sort of opened the doors for reaction videos to th- sort of thrive in that space. Um, there are you know a lot of reaction videos, uh, reaction channels I know that do anime specific videos. They started or did live action and branched into anime as well. Um, LM reactions, you know, Lola and Milena from Serbia is an example. Like they didn't really have you know uh, any anime on their channel, so it was like a gamble to put it on there. Um, they had seen you know some older previous stuff like naruto and everything but like they wanted to give it a try with attack on titan and attack on titan was a huge catalyst because of how grounded it was like anime as much as i love it can be an, an acquired taste for a lot of people you got and, me into it yeah uh so attack on titan as you know, people call it like the game of thrones of anime but just because of how grounded it is how like you know sort of serious and dire it is um and it really uh, grips people from the get-go um so i knew when that show was gonna finish again the attack on titan like uh, the timeline of reactions i just described that attack on titan was there the whole time from the beginning from Mm -hmm. 2013 and onward all a a whole decade worth of that show because of the hiatus the hiatus they would take um between seasons was so long that it just lasted like you know a a decade plus um so when it was ending now we were lived in a space where all these channels you know birthed and grew up with the show and they either caught up with it for the first time recently or they were day one, you know, viewers or whatever. But I knew it was going to be a big, significant sort of cultural conversation about, like, you know, seeing the show end as much as like Lost or anything, you know, mm-hmm. like finally uh, coming to a, a conclusion. And so I figured, you know, the best idea to would be to have some channels come together and just have a, you know, fun conversation about it. And specifically the way it impacted their channels, you know, the way, you know, it, you know, drove them to find new audiences it drove them to find new you know material to watch you know with anime after that Mm -hmm. um and just how it impacted them as creators but also just how you know as fans we were you know eager to talk about that that, the finale of that incredible show and you had how many people on for that episode that was like a 10 person panel uh it's it's amazing you're like a you're like a real ringleader of managing to harness 10 (laughs) reactors talking about their favorite anime of all time because anime is one of these uh you know speaking of something that deserves more hype maybe like not like i need to plug anime as a concept <laughs> but there's there's a specific problem with reacting to most anime on the internet and i think you know we've talked about it a lot like internally um it's that you know there are different copyright laws in japan and they're they go down real hard for anyone doing any sort of taking any sort of second of reaction for um yeah. anything so it, it's really hard to do uh reactions to anime specifically that have any of the visuals of the anime on the on the screen yeah you'll notice yeah any reaction channel that does anime has like you know the, all their you know bells and whistles on like what they got to do to it you know transparency you know cropping stuff like that to try and get it past the auto detection system and again if they if they could have a conversation i'm sure they would love to talk about what parameters you know would be acceptable to use but Yes, the copyright laws in Japan are very different, and so it's difficult to, you know, even you know approach that, you know, idea. Um, Yubo Roshi, you know, mentioned that maybe some things are shifting because he just went out to Japan for a Jujutsu Kaisen, you know, um, you know, a sponsored event. They had to, he said, they had to approve their channel to the studio. The studio had to know, like, that makes Jujutsu Kaisen, like, what they do for a living, you know, on mm-hmm. their channel. And so that was like he said that was like you know interesting that they got approval in that sense to go out there and go do that, um, and uh, yeah. So but anime you know for channels in general it's just it's been you know uh, a fraught issue for them because uh, studios um, not don't go through just the YouTube system but they'll go you know through their party services that we know of to you know target channels like on youtube and on patreon and other platforms to take down uh their material you know like a, a easy example is on etsy you know if you make anim- anime material on etsy your you know page is you know very subject to gain taking down um mm-hmm. things like that so yeah it, it's, it's very tenuous to react to anime material online um and but you know when we did it and like i was able to put everyone together for that uh crossing the streams episode mm-hmm. um it, it, i think everyone like you know express the same again the 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 communal aspect of you know like we understand together like we like we all went through the same thing of trying to figure out how to get past that you know threshold of like anime reactions and once you're able to then it's like a very rewarding experience because it opens the doors for so many things that you can uh you can watch uh, moving forward for your channel i mean i think one of the funniest things um when i when i at least we started passion fruit was 
uh, explaining, you know, how this kind of fit into the larger creator economy and just what a large audience, uh, you know, reactors have. Like, even if you've never heard of them, we're talking about, like, I think we just tallied up once uh, a group of reactors that you knew personally. I think it's maybe the, maybe the 40. We looked down this list that you originally gave me. It's probably around the 40 people that we that you've already interviewed in these past few seasons. But it, it totaled up to over a billion over a billion uh, channel subscribers. Like we're talking yeah. about like a massive audience and some of these people have millions of followers. And so, yeah. well, it seems like this hyper niche topic that sometimes people are like, how, how is this really part of the creator economy? Cause when we think of creators, we think of this or we think of that, but there is just so much interest in of course, pop culture and the people who, who love pop culture in a certain kind of way and have such a an appreciation like uh, there's such super fans that their super fandom has gotten elevated to. We will just watch them watch stuff. Um, yeah. They're the, the big, they have themselves become celebrities and it's been such an interesting, like, you know, just journey to watch you interview all these people to, to hear about their uh, like trajectories and their own journeys, uh, watching them go from fans to people who, who, who show up at conventions themselves or have conventions themselves in the case of the normies. And it's yeah. been, you know, I mean, how how much bigger is this space? I guess is my one of my questions, and I'm sure uh, a lot of people are interested in. Okay, I've seen these forty episodes. What what? Where do we go from here? Yeah, um, yeah. I, when we started, uh, yeah, I did like a, a rundown of just the people I sort of knew personally by that point. You know, over the years of working with them, and yeah, like the the sort of collective viewership they have is you know uh, uh, considerable. You know, to say what the, you know who they're reaching out to, um, but from there. I've had the opportunity to meet so many great people and, you know, find so many, you know, great channels um, that have, you know, their own viewership that just like either they, you know, were more recent or, you know, they, uh, I just wasn't aware of them at first. And like, I'm grateful to find them now. Um, but everyone I've talked to has been like really pleasant and um, just, you know, great to, uh, to speak with because they all have such unique insight on like their experience with their channels. Um, but yeah, finding more, as uh, time has gone on and like just sort of seeing the, you know, the vastness of the space. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because like there are channels that have, you know, quote unquote, like, you know, made it, you know, they've you know passed the million subscriber count and they're doing really well. Um, but there are channels who, uh, who have been around for, you know, a while who maybe just, you know, reached like a hundred K and like, you know, mm-hmm. they put a lot of work in over like, you know, a more number of years. Um, but the people that they're reaching out to from channel to channel is unique. I think that's the main thing is that the you each community that they have is unique. You'll see people, you know, who like reactions in general, you know, maybe go from like, you know, I love blind wave. I love the normies. I love, you know, the real reject, so on. Uh, but I think the inter- most interesting thing is that you'll have people who are like, like you said, I want to watch whatever Nikki and Steven do. I don't want to watch whatever TBR Schmidt does. I like this person specifically, you know, I can, so being able to see those sort of interactions has been really interesting to me. Cause like, then you're able to get more recommendations from people who are asking for like, Hey, I want my favorite person to come on the show and be interviewed. That's so, that's so cool. Um, so in terms of the space, we've talked a little bit about what got you into it with the walking dead. What has been some of your favorite sort of, surprising reactions uh, of content that you didn't think that you'd ever be into or that that surprised you that you actually like watching as, as a reaction video. Um, it's tough to say because like I go into like, you know, reaction videos, like pretty open-minded. Like, I think that's the main thing is like everyone has, you know, channels that they like they're like oh i got like this person not so much like these other pies you guys you know like they'll, they'll they'll stick to one channel maybe sometimes or they'll find a few that they like um when i you know in this job as i've you know found more channels i go into it with open mind just understanding like everyone is unique everyone has their own insight about like you know how they're going to digest the material mm-hmm. um the i think the main thing that i like to do is find specific movies that i know pretty well and then i can dissect how they react to it and so like i'm able to engage with that and sort of like understand them a little more about you know the way they're they're interacting with the material um Mm -hmm. i think one that we uh saw uh recently is a hereditary hereditary is one that really shows you who someone is like while they're watching it it like really breaks down those barriers you mm-hmm. know which, like that they have like that as they're putting up to like you know be on camera like it really sort of like an, uh, disarms them in a way mm-hmm. um 
so yeah so stuff like that it's been like really interesting to watch um i think yeah but if there's any material that i just didn't know if i would like um i mean music reactions has been like just a, a different sort of you know whole genre uh, of reactions that i wasn't really privy to uh that long ago and then um i started to delve more into it just because like it would show up on um certain people's channels like they would do you know music video reactions or they would do you know like they would have like a, a music channel specific channel to do that stuff um johnny odell you know did the edit reactions uh compilations for like the drake and kendrick you know beef mm -hmm. you know, this past year uh, so things like that you know just like discovering more you know of the those different genres has been interesting uh, to me so do you think we uh, can have that to look forward to next season on Reactiverse? Some uh, music reactors, possibly? It, it's possible, yeah. Like, I, I'd had to do a lot more research <laughs> into that mm -hmm. space, I think. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I'm definitely open to it, just obviously because I think that's a huge, you know, again, demographic of people. It's just going to be the uh, Sabrina Carpenter trilogy <laughs> of, of videos that we're just going to watch on a repeat. Um, yeah, I'll start there. Yeah, <laughs> you just start there, and then from there, we just we just go right into the Barry Keegan verse, and it's going to yeah. be perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, Eric, just again, thank you so much for the two seasons of amazing content, content, no, <laughs> to me, these amazing shows and interviews that we've been doing, uh, for Reactiverse and crossing the streams. You've definitely made your, your love and your appreciation of these channels and all the hard work you've been putting into th these channels and, and the, the community space, I think on behalf of everyone in there, although I'm not a reactor myself, I think everybody uh, I can speak for everybody and say just a big thank you for just raising awareness for the issues and personalities in this space. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's been great. It's been like a, a little over a year now since we started, and um, it's been really rewarding. Yeah, just to help people that I already knew, you know, share their story, find new people to share their story. Um, uh, the compliments I've gotten have been very, you know, kind and nice from, uh, you know, uh, people who, you know, have, you know, you know, expressed, you know, like the experience that they've had on the show and um, just be able to sit down and talk uh, and tell, you know, what what they've gone through. Um, yeah, I think overall, my the most rewarding thing I've, I've been able to sort of touch upon with uh, the channel so far and the interviews is just being able to find people who... Mm -hmm are fans of them already and get to know more about them. Um, mm -hmm. cause I think, you know, just it's, it's helpful. I think it's helpful for these creators to be seen as like people who have, you know, like, you know, hills to climb. Um, it's not just a, a job that people can, you know, crank out videos like easily enough and just to show appreciation for what they do on a daily basis and like the community that they bring to the, you know, internet as a whole. And, and I think something that, you know, you've really brought to passion fruit, uh, you know, as, as an ethos, it's just how much, it is a job. It is a work. It is, it is a career choice that people are making. We've seen this, you know, people be interviewed, talk about quitting their full-time jobs to come do this full time. And that is work. It is labor. As, as we like to say, creator labor is labor and creative labor is labor. And I think in addition to that, as part of that, it's also an industry. So the work you do, the work people who do music and graphics do, I mean, this is, this is a whole, you know, imagine it like Hollywood, there's, you know, the people who are in front of the camera and then there's people who are editing it together. And I mean, uh, I think I have pers personal, pers ah, firsthand personal knowledge of just how much of a process that can be, especially with the copyright stuff and just how much work goes into just the just the editing of, of <laughs> making this material. So yeah. uh, so I think it's it's really great to just explore that space a little bit more and get shit a little bit more light on how much of a you know, a field of industry this is because this is a giant like creator economy that we love to talk about, but rarely do we talk about like the actual workforce that makes up of it, uh, makes, uh, makes it up. Nope. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> it's an important aspect of like the creator economy stuff that we've, you know, covered on passion fruit. Um, obviously, you know, the easy thing to say about, you know, content creators in a way is like, you know, they are influencers, like, you know, they're the Mr. Beast of the world, stuff like that. But there's always like, you know, the huge sort of middle class, so to speak, of the creators who are, you know, making a living off of the stuff. And all they want to do is have like that, that sustainability to keep mm -hmm. doing it. Um, again, the reason I really love reactions is because so much of it is built out of like a love of the game. It's a love of like sharing the material with other people. Um, making money off of that is like just a way to keep doing it. It's a 
means to an end. The money is not so much the end for them. It's like the means to keep going. The end is to keep sharing those experiences with the viewers and just keep finding new movies and to keep finding new shows and like, you know, learning, experiencing, you know, like, you know, finding out more about themselves um, through it. And uh, one thing I don't want to forget to mention is, you know, like we saw um, Alex Winter's documentary, The YouTube Effect, about, you know, the radicalization like that goes through YouTube now um, in like a post- you know, QAnon era of like, you know, misinformation that's spread out and like, you know, weaponized for viewers. Um, and the reason I really love reactions is because it harkens back to like, it's sort of like the core idea of like what YouTube started with, which is like sharing things with people across the world um, that's just, like, you know, shared interests and shared you know, ideas um, and being able to build a community in the reaction space of from people who are, you know, coming together off of like, specific materials, whether it be music or a movie or a TV show or funny video, um, that just feels like it's sort of holding on to that idealistic nature of like what the internet and YouTube can be um, for people. It's not, you know, ideological, like, you know, weaponized, you know, things to like make you feel angry or scared. It's to help you, you know, find common ground and like, you know, passion for something with someone that you are willingly going into to hopefully be passionate about with them. Yeah, I mean, I you know, Star Wars community or fandom gets a bad rap, but you, we've seen them recently rally really hard against the idea that like there is a certain type of of person who who makes commentary or reactions to that kind of content that is that is maybe toxic and it just has no place for people who are generally genuinely just fans and have you know actual criticism of of uh, the con you know of the shows and want to connect with people about it and want to have their, you know, world about it, that it's a whole world yeah. for them. And it doesn't need to be like a toxic space that you're making a brand off of uh, just yeah. hating anything that is quote unquote woke. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to close this out the way that you usually close it out. We might have to modify these questions a bit. We have our own version of the Prowse questionnaire. We can mm -hmm. call it uh, the, uh, the uh, nerd chronic canair. <laughs> nerd chronic canair. That was yeah. a great canair. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, why don't we just, uh, you know, as this applies to your, your experience as either a interviewer or an editor of reaction channels or a fan, mm -hmm. let's just say, what is your favorite show? My personal favorite show is Battlestar Galactica. Um, <laughs> my favorite, uh, show that I've seen people react to is either Attack on Titan or probably Avatar The Last Airbender. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, what about your favorite film? My favorite film is Short Careful. Term 12. Yes, that's right. That's true. <laughs> it's Short Term 12. That's my favorite film of all time. Correct. Um Right behind that is Arrival, uh, which is like, a, I think, a much bigger, uh, more easily recognizable film. Um, and again, my favorite film to watch people react to is probably like Hereditary or like Scream or Cabin in the Woods. Um, <laughs> a lot of horror you know, stuff, I think, is uh, really a lot of fun to, to get people in there. <laughs> Recently, got into like I love watching people watch M Night Shyamalan films for films for the first time. It yeah, is, shout it out is, to <laughs> yeah. shout out to our guy Ewan. I will say like the person like Drew's been like very gracious about like you know seeing everyone that we've you know I've talked to and like learning more about them. The one that has risen to the top, I think, as her favorite one is EOM reacts. Um, so if you're hope. watching this man, like you, 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 you got to the top there. <laughs> I will watch, I will watch anything that he, the, that he's watching. I, I rarely watch comedies, but I will watch that man watch based balls. It's just that funny. He's great. Yeah. And his reaction to the village was just like the best movie, a movie reaction I've seen in a very long time. Yeah. Uh, so that is true, but this is not an, this is not a questionnaire about me. So back to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, what, uh, what stresses you out? Great question. <laughs> um that's a good question that's one i ask everyone you know on the show and i know it's like a hard one to sort of quantify but um for myself it's like just you know obviously time and stay on top of things um just managing the the you know litany of stuff that i have on my plate but also um i think wendy from the movie couple expressed this it's the um idea of like saying saying no like it's hard for me to say no to things it's hard for me to turn down projects and you know uh, requests from people just because i um come from like a you know background of like having a job for many years that was like 
not steady from day one, even though the last I was there for a long time, but every day it was like, I might lose it tomorrow. So I need to have a backup. And so I always live my life of like juggling multiple jobs and like gigs to support myself in case one falls through. I have another to bounce off of and just never putting all my eggs in one basket. Yeah. It's that hustle grind culture mentality of, of making content on the internet. And we've yeah. seen, we've seen how that can burn out real quick. I, Hmm. Applaud you for not saying work-life balance. Good job on that. Uh, what helps you relax? <laughs> um, help me relax is obviously being at home, like with my dogs and you know my significant other, so to speak, and uh, just uh, no, just being able to uh, step away from the work in a way that makes me feel like I'm not like abandoning it or like you know like leaving it, but just that it's complete like you know, completing the work and then getting to relax as like, you know, sort of my benefit from that, like making my brain not have to worry about the exterior stuff. Um, and also, uh, as I found out recently, um, going to a casino or an arcade, <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, the, I think the lights and the beeps and boops, like all, you know, help me, my brain sort of shut off for a little bit. Arcades, casinos, they're all good. Everyone yeah. tell your friends, tell your kids. It's a healthy yeah. habit. Uh, what is well speaking of what is one hobby or passion you have outside of TV or film besides I guess gambling? <laughs> yeah, um, board games. Like yeah, like I like board games a lot. Uh, my always my favorite one is Unmatched. I think I've mentioned it a couple times on here. Um, it's like this really cool fighting game with like you know these interesting figurines, like, like and dozens of characters from like King Arthur to Buffy to Ghost Rider to Bigfoot to the T Rex from Jurassic Park. The Da Vinci and not Da Vinci, uh, Houdini, Houdini. Da Vinci probably will be there one day. I bet Shakespeare, um, Shakespeare, Bruce Lee, um, come, Bruce Lee, uh, Muhammad Ali coming soon. Uh, the Witcher, Teen Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like yeah, it's like it's a huge game. If you haven't heard of it, please go try it out. It's a lot of fun. It's the real crossing the streams of board games. I'll <laughs> yeah. put it that way. Uh, yeah. What fictional character do you relate to or deeply care about? Um. It's a good question. It's one again. I ask everyone else, and like I know that's one that they. I think that's the one that trips them up the most. Um, but I don't know. I, I, again, like my favorite film is Short Term Twelve, and like it's it seems like I guess odd to like relate to Brie Larson, like because like her character has like such specific traumas that I don't have like personally in my life, but I empathize with a lot just like because of how she channels that to the people around her, um, mm -hmm. and you know her effort to help people. Um, and like you know, dedicating her life to that, uh, I just find that you know really inspirational. Um, I just yeah, I there's a line in there I really like that she they when Caitlin Dever is going to come in her character, and they say like you know please take good care of her. She's like take I she says I take good care of everyone, like mm -hmm. that sort of you know philosophy is like just like what I sort of strive to have. It's just like not favoring anyone, just like giving everyone a chance to be you know heard and seen and taken care of. Uh, what is your, oh, that's a great question. I mean, if you keep saying great question to questions that you write, do they still count as great questions? Uh, they are. Yeah. I'll say, yeah, yeah. They, all, they all are. <laughs> uh, what is your guilty pleasure show or film? And I'll adapt this to saying, what is your guilty pleasure show or film to watch other people react to? Uh, a guilty pleasure. It's hard. Like, uh, again, like maybe horror stuff just because like again that disarms people so much and it, it's obvious that they're struggling <laughs> you know mm -hmm. a lot to, to get through it so like like in one sense like it's it's really entertaining for me i know it's hard for them um especially people who aren't just horror savvy and like it's like a hard thing you know again we watched eom reacts you know watch the exorcist and that was a tough one for him to get through <laughs> um <laughs> but uh uh no i i like uh watching um yeah i think hard traumatic things for people to watch like last of us you know i loved mm -hmm. watching reactions to that um it's, i guess not a guilty pleasure but I, I feel guilty for taking pleasure in their <laughs> trauma you know <laughs> like, i thought you were I, gonna say like mickey from watching 90 day fiance but okay sure like watching uh, for, for, for reactions trauma. yeah for for myself <laughs> for watching i guess like watching the again like people will say this uh, a lot of people say this the the trash reality tv is mm -hmm. like such a great one to sort of like again unplug your brain from i think that's like the really value i found like especially in this sort of hustle culture as we've said people who do you know viewing as a living mm -hmm. reality tv is such a great escape for them to yeah. be like i'm gonna watch this thing and not to, to just let it flow over me 
It's weird. You don't see a lot of uh, reality TV reactions, except from reality TV shows themselves. Like 90 Day Fiance will have people, they will have their own cast members react yeah. to other people doing season. Great time to plug, yeah. by the way. It's not my book, but uh, everyone should pick up a copy of Hugh the Sun by Emily Nassbaum. Little surprise winner. Uh, it's the history of reality television starting from the 1940s and the radio, uh, like, uh, you know, Queen for a Day stuff, the Chuck Barris, all the way up to you know, the modern bachelor, bachelorette, golden bachelor, bachelorette, uh, yeah. and, and the shot, like the sort of shot and Freud, we all kind of take in participation programs like that. And it's, it's an yeah. amazing book. Um, yeah. really great deep, do- uh, deep dive exploration. So I, I plug that real also, hard. Also, uh, yeah. Also shout out to, uh, Normies After Dork and Chris James for the, oh my uh, God. the other, uh, reactor adjacent channels that we found recently who are, uh, who watch, uh, reality TV shows to commentate on. Yeah, real shout out to Chris James. Uh, I, I want you to fall asleep at night. It's it's really good. But sometimes I laugh so hard that I I can't fall asleep. Um, uh, let's see, let's see what else we got. Um, what show or film gave you your exper- favorite experience with the channel, or what show or film's reaction gave you your favorite experience uh, with the channel? Um, well, in my, in my research, like trying to find people's reactions and like uh, you know discovering like you know when i find a new channel that i'm not you know super familiar with at first i'll do my research so i still like get, get a vibe you know from how they you know uh react to stuff and like understand them a little more um again like eom reacts was great uh catherine lasalle and her star wars content was like really fun to, to watch especially in the time that it was you know coming out um i really like you know recently gallifrey gals um and cat and their uh reaction uh, to Battlestar that's going on like still currently so everyone go check that out um i would say also angela from Funny Little Guy Reacts. I mean, she was just such a treat to have on, and I, she is such a huge fan of the space. Um, she is, in my opinion, again, not to show throw shade or like you know dismiss anyone else. She is sort of my pick of like the reactor sort of archetype of someone that I like to sort of show as like this is the sort of like spectrum of like what reaction wow. is she she does like really great intros like you know really informative intros but, like you know what she's seen going into the episodes she does like really long you know like introspective uh you know outros talking about the episode and like what it, like what what she's dissecting from it um and she's like very emotional about the material she can cry she can laugh she can you know be invested about the characters um and so yeah i really highly, highly recommend her her videos I was gonna say, uh, I've, I've, uh, um, the channel they are called. I'm trying to. I'm, I know one of their name previewed. Yeah, Jane Adams. Their their Ghostbuster Frozen Empire. I, I know. No, no, uh, no um, preferences here about who edited that video. But I thought that was a really well done video for something I probably would not have had that much interest in. Uh, normally, so that's, I'm just gonna answer these questions too. Uh, that's yeah, fun for me. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> um. What show or film do you wish you could erase from your memory and watch someone react to for the first time? Um, I'll, I'll tweak it a little bit. I, I want okay, go ahead. What show? Your what choice? show from what I want to want everyone to erase their memories and react to the free into the first time? Mm-hmm. One, it's Scream. That's the easy answer. Um, really? Two, two, Cabin in the Woods, like those things. So I just love. Those are just my two favorite horror films, and like so, I love because uh, of the way they dissect, you know, horror tropes and like archetypes and like you know structural uh, ideas about horror. And so, like, seeing people uh, take that in and like mm-hmm. seeing how that affects them is so uh, interesting to me. Because like again, like it's 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 such a culturally impactful um, film. Uh, both of them are, and like, I like seeing how that impacts people's viewing experience about movies, um, but also. Uh, I wouldn't need to erase everyone's memory from this uh, because no one reacted to it. But I would love to see people um, react to Short Term Twelve. <laughs> I would love to see mm-hmm. like everyone just give that like for my birthday if I could like you know send out like a blast to everyone like hey, just, everyone just please react to this movie for my birthday. Just like just watch that movie and like uh, and just so I can see your <laughs> experience with it. <laughs> no, I'm thinking, like, I don't think I saw that many people reacting to Shang Chi, which is the same director. Uh... Because that came out during this weird period, right? Like, I didn't. I, yeah. I'm not sure if I started to mention Shang Chi direct. If you liked anyone's well, Shang Chi reactions, go watch yeah. uh, <laughs> Shirt from Twelve. Please, yeah. reactors. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was gonna say, you know, I, this might be too much of a uh, easy one day answer, but I would say 
the sixth sense. I'd like to erase the sixth sense from everyone's memory and have mm-hmm. them go back with the full knowledge of how movies have used the sixth sense to like, oh, yeah. you know, game our reactions to stuff. Uh, but then try to see if, how many people actually get it. Because watching <laughs> EOM recently do, do The Village, just watching his mind be absolutely blown by yeah. one of those early Shyamalan films was, uh, it was, it was really a joy to see. Yeah, anything with like yeah those big twists, I think would be great. Um, just to see people, you know, like uh, to, to digest for the first time uh, mm-hmm. those like big cultural twists that you know you can't escape because like they're so well known. It's some of the most beautiful parts of of the reaction community is realizing that some people have just missed their entire lives watching the Usual Suspects or even hearing anything about Seven or like yeah. you know one of, some of these big big movies that like I think of as like everyone's seen Fight Club, right? Not everyone has seen Fight Club. And some yeah. of them will react to it. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, the common thread I've seen from people, it's just like, you know, I grew up like not watching movies. Like it was like not my thing. I, you know, I played games or read books or, you know, watched like, you know, like uh, rom-coms or something like that. And like now people are using this as an opportunity to, you know, expand their horizons more uh, and find more things to, to uh, learn about in film. Um, it's also a funny thing. There's a little bit of a tangent, but I saw someone post one of those like nostalgic videos on Twitter the other day about like Blockbuster, people shopping on a Friday night at Blockbuster. I thought about it and I was like, man, you know, it's interesting as for as much shit as we give like you know streaming you know the streaming era of films um it really did sort of break down barriers of like how accessible film is to people because the thing is like if you weren't like a like a movie nerd or cinephile or whatever in the early 90s um you wouldn't go to blockbuster you wouldn't go in there to go get anything because you would be like this is i don't know what this place is i don't know like i don't know what i want from here you know it's like you had to go there deliberately to go get a movie you had to get in your car go drive to the store to go get a movie that you want to go see um and i think that sort of you know gave way to a lot of a generation of people who are like i didn't go see movies because i didn't much interested so they weren't in front of me to go watch them now with like streaming i think there are a lot of people we see in the reaction space and beyond of people being like yeah i have netflix like i'll watch what's on there now i'll watch django that's on that just showed up but you know like i think that's sort of you know as a big reason why we're seeing a generation of people find and discover these movies for the first time yeah i mean look everyone has their blind spots i mean i i didn't see lord of the rings until fairly recently and you know i had i i, I there's there I've, I have tons of movies like that where i'm just like oh I, I guess that one missed me i hadn't seen most i think until 2018 i hadn't seen any like uh the mcu besides maybe like uh ragnarok if that came out yeah. then and I think that was like my first MCU film. It would have been like, great. Yeah, it was capturing me understanding what the MC was at the time. Although yeah. <laughs> I've been told I talk too much to be a reactor. <laughs> Seems <laughs> ironic. Uh, I talk too much and I'm too distracted to, to be a good reactor. Um, so speaking of, what advice would you give to uh, your past self and or anybody looking to enter uh, either the reaction space or uh, the tangential industry of reactions, as it were? Yeah. Um, to my past self, like specifically like me, like I would say, um, yeah, keep banking, <laughs> keep banking videos, like stay ahead of schedule. And uh, like, yeah, so, so you usually have like backups of things. Like once you have like a good runaway, like try to keep that, like don't let it like, you know, outrun you. Um, hustle but also, more? You, know, you tell yourself yeah. hustle more? No, like hustle <laughs> at, in the beginning. Like, I guess this would be applicable to other channels as well, I guess to mm-hmm. everyone. Like, when you're starting and no one has like any anticipation for like what your release schedule is or like what you're putting out, like bank videos, like give yourself like a month's worth of material to like put out. So that way there's never a day where you feel like, Oh my God, like I have nothing to put out tomorrow. Like, you know, like, Oh, like it's Friday. I have nothing to put out. Like Frankenstein's chick, you know, part two <laughs> isn't, isn't going to work, you know, like you don't want to run to that. Um, you know, so if you're, if you're going to start like a movie channel, like movie reaction channel, uh, yes watch a ton of movies like record them like start editing them like do that and just get them done again like what everyone will say is like don't get it perfect don't worry about making it look you know perfect don't make it worry about you know like having all the graphics and everything like down to a t just Mm -hmm. get it done and put it out and figure out along the way but in that time before you start give yourself like a good runway of material to put out. Like don't start and like, just, you know, shoot at the hip because that is how people get into like the, the sink of like 
okay, I'm, I'm now I'm hustling. Now I'm trying to keep up with like this thing that's getting traction. And I want to stay on top of that. Um, that is how you get into like, you know, burnout and like all these things, you got to give yourself time and some like, you know, a buffer zone of work to put out. So that way you don't feel the pressure, like, you know, of breathing down your neck to stay on top of your own schedule. And what is what is one sign I think, and I'll end it here because this is technically the end of the questions. But I I just want to know for as a you know as somebody who's a seasoned professional of of watching reactors, what is one sign that you can tell that a reactor is you know hitting a limit or they're 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 just you know going at a pace that is is not sustainable. Um, when it's obvious that you know looking through like their social media posts or something like that, um, that the work life balance is starting to slip a little bit. Uh, I always advocate, you know, like focus on your life first, like the channel second, um, take breaks, take vacations, um, prioritize, you know, loved ones and, you know, other work if it's going to like, you know, make if it's making you a living. Um, and if I start seeing people post like, sorry guys, like I, I'm working on the edit, you know, right now it's, you know, 2 a.m. and I'll get it out as soon as I can. And I would just have a long day at work, you know, like, or, you know, my, my dog was sick or something like that. Those type of things, like I can, see it's like uh, someone's you know they're struggling a little bit and like they I, I hope that they can level out soon so they don't feel you know the pressure um again one, one of the main reasons i got into the reaction space behind the scenes in general as like crossing the threshold of being a viewer to a participant was uh being a fan of iman snow and you know seeing how often she would say she was a mother of two young boys and thinking like man like she must like have a full plate of reacting to videos and like having two kids to take care of and editing those videos and so on. Like, it was just like, sort of like, I don't know how someone could like put themselves through that on that type of schedule. So when she mentioned, you know, need an editor, I sort of jumped at the chance. Cause like, it was like more of like an empathy thing. I was like, I, Hey, like, I know you have a, a lot in your life going on. Like if you ever need help editing, I'm, you know, willing to help you out in that sense, just to see if that works. And uh, yeah, we, you know, it's been a great working relationship ever since. But that was like my sort of core thing is like seeing how people, you know, have to really balance their lives in this space because it is so taxing. It takes so much time to do that. Uh, I don't want anyone to feel like, you know, they, they, they can't do it. They can't, you know, uh, hash out the time to do it from the work lives. They can't hash out like the mental capacity to do it, you know, from like the viewership pressure. Um, yeah, just being able to sort of like spot everyone's, uh, you know, expressions so like how they're feeling with the work and how it relates to their life is like how I sort of see like, okay, are they sort of, you know, hurting here a little bit on top of that as well? I'll say, I don't want to forget, um, uh, acclimating to the culture of, you know, the internet can be a big, you know, shell shock, you know, for a lot of people. Uh, it's not for everyone. And the unfortunate tactic people say is like, oh, just ignore it. It's not, don't take it personally, you know, like you can't, you know, let it get to you. Um, and that's just like the unfortunate, like, you know, uh, advice people give, cause that's how you have to sort of like, you know, shut it out as opposed to like trying to fix any sort of in, 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 institutional, you know, problems with it. Cause it's just so daunting to think of it could change. Um, there's a channel that I really liked, you know, several years ago, who's a walking dead reactor. Her name was like Naomi E reacts. Um, she was like this young girl, you know, like 21 years old, uh, just getting into college. Uh, and she was reacting to the walking dead. Um, and she was a very emotional reactor. She was very good. She quickly, you know, um, amassed like, you know, like 50,000 subscribers in like the in less than a year. And, uh, she would frequently post in her community post, like, Hey guys, like, I really appreciate all the views and the you know, comments on the videos. Um, I know my crying isn't really for everyone. Like, and I, I, like, you know, it's hard. Like I, it's, that's just my raw emotions. So like, can you please stop being, you know, mean about when I cry and things like that. And she kept sort of posting things like that. And eventually I saw that one day she just like shut her channel down. And I know Hi. that the pressure of like doing that and like she shut, also shut down her social media and everything. Um, so it's those things that really, you know, pain me to see. Like I hate seeing someone, you know, trying their hand at this and getting shot down by, um, yes, like the pressure of the comments of, you know, like feeling like they're not living up to like the standards that they want themselves to be at. Um, it's all about finding your own personal balance. Like the balance that works for you is not the same balance that's going to work for other people. Everyone is different. Everyone in the space is very unique. Your interactions are unique. Just like never compare yourself to anyone 
of, of how well they're doing or how well you're doing. Mm -hmm. Just appreciate, you know, what you've accomplished on a day-to-day -day basis and just mm -hmm. try to push that to the next one. I, I will say that it is one of the most vulnerable uh, kinds of YouTubing or like you, creator experiences I've ever experienced theme is is weirdly enough reactions because it is mm. the one place where you will see grown men cry on the regular um people just crying regularly because that is it's a genuine expression and watching people cry it's kind of like vomiting like when somebody starts to vomit and you start to vomit i've started crying a lot more watching media because just watching other people cry and, and tear up and feeling you know yes that empathetic desire to connect and to see what other people are connecting to makes me just feel a little bit more human uh, in this world. So it, it it's yeah. really sucks that, that people are getting, you know, shut out from doing that or feeling like they're being scrutinized for something that is such a human and often under, you know, kind of, uh, you know, subsumed expression of, of humanity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, that's a reason I love the reaction space. It's like, it's built around, you know, shared passions and like what, you know, Roger Eber called the empathy machine of, you know, movies and like what that does for people, like bringing people together. Um, I think it's like a really important aspect of the internet that I am proud to yeah be a part of and help foster. Yeah, I think that's so great. And speaking of uh, starting to get that edit out at 2 a.m., it is currently 2.49 on a Sunday night. So uh, it, and this will be out tomorrow morning. So thank you so yeah, much so if for you're, two, if, you're yeah. wa if you're watching, sorry, if you're watching this in the morning when this comes out, you're, you're watching this about seven to eight hours after we recorded it <laughs> so talk about like a good edit turnaround this is yeah. this is the man this is the legend this is uh nerd chronic and his <laughs> amazing second season of reactiverse coming to a close so we'll be taking a couple weeks uh break uh while we get ready for season three but then we have some great stuff to come um on the channel so please hit that like and subscribe and do you want to do you want to hit us out eric yeah, uh, you can find us at Neurochronic across social media, also at Passion Fruit for us across social media. You can find Drew at Video Drew across social media. You can find our links to our Patreon and Discord down below in the video description and the video itself right here. And we'll catch everyone on the next episode. Subscribe to our newsletter. Bye.